AR6 is my Formula One pylon racer design. It first flew in 2005. The airplane was built by David Hoover and his crew chief Gary Dulesky and Craig Cato. David is not only a very proficient race pilot, but he's also a meticulous craftsman, as you can see. He finished the airplane as a show plane, unlike most racers, so it's not only fast, but pretty as well. I started the design in 1993 after meeting another race pilot, Troy Channing, at Oshkosh. He wanted a new airplane, and I wanted to further explore some of the ideas I'd used on the AR-5. I had just completed the general aerodynamic and structural layout when Troy was killed in an airplane accident near Livermore, California, and I lost interest in the project. Until five years later when I met David Hoover, who was also looking for a new airplane. We made a deal in which I agreed that I would furnish detailed design and, because the fuselage would require molding, that I would furnish all necessary master patterns and that I would oversee construction. David, who had been racing in the class for years, would handle the engine installation and cooling. Because I'm an old school, do-it-yourself kind of guy, and because I didn't know how to use CAD and wasn't able to work out the fuselage cross-sections any other way, I worked out their shape by making another foam model, an inch to a foot, same scale as the general arrangement drawing. When I was happy with it, I took the fuselage section templates right off it using duct tape, bondo, and masonite. I'm using this same method here on a car model. It has a hard surface and it's been waxed and PVA'd, so it doesn't need to be covered in tape like the styrofoam does. I'm sanding them flush here. It works surprisingly well. These sections were used later to make this car. You'll see me doing something similar later on the full-size plug. When I had the fuselage sections drawn on the three view, I was ready to go to work. The big difference between the AR-5 and the AR-6 is in the fuselage. The AR-6 fuselage is full of compound curves, while the AR-5 uses mostly straight lines. Otherwise, they're both low-wing single-seaters. Those of you who have seen the AR-5 tapes will be familiar with the construction of the wings and tail surfaces of the AR-6. Both use solid foam cores covered with either glass, as in the case of the AR-5, or a combination of carbon fiber and glass in the case of the AR-6. As opposed to a the landing gear geometry is the same for both airplanes. 
And because Mike also wanted to reduce the wetted or surface area of the fuselage as much as possible to minimize the drag caused by skin friction, he elected to make the whole fuselage, including cowl and canopy, curvy. And that meant that it would have to be made from molds. The AR-5 fuselage was made entirely without molds. Once he decided to use molds, he was free to get as swoopy and curvy as he wanted to in the design of the AR-6. Because with molds, a curved line is just as easy to make as a straight line. The first thing you need if you're going to make molds is a good plug. In this case, Mike made just one master plug from which he took molds for the right and left sides, the upper deck, the upper and lower cowl halves, and the canopy in its frame. All of the parting lines were scribed onto the plug so that they would transfer onto the molds and eventually onto the parts where they became, in many cases, the trim lines. Whatever was on the plug wound up on the parts. The plug was everything. Plugs rule. To keep the frontal area as small as possible, he wanted to make the cowl fit as close to the engine around the cylinder heads as he could without actually touching them. And he also wanted to make sure that he had enough room under the engine to clear the tuned exhaust. It would be a disaster to pull expensive cowl parts out of those expensive molds and discover that the cowl needed bumps to clear the spark plugs or that the exhaust wouldn't fit. To be certain that the engine with its exhaust system would actually fit inside our cowl properly, he knew he would have to make the fuselage plug around a dummy engine and exhaust. It was the only way to be really sure. He first designed a backbone or spine that would be stiff and strong enough to support the weight of the foam and fiberglass plug while suspended from its ends. It's made from masonite and three-quarter by three-quarter inch pine put together with Elmer's glue and brads. Particular attention is paid to keeping it straight and square. The longerons are doubled at the joints and the masonite joints are fiberglass so that it came out light and very stiff and strong. It's good to keep the plug light not only because it's easier to work with and manhandle around, but also so it doesn't sag under its own weight like a sway-backed horse. Those pipes are in there so he can roll the plug easily while he works on it, like a rotisserie. Then the dummy engine was attached. The dummy engine was made like this. I first identified the high points and possible problem areas of the engine as the valve covers, the spark plugs, one exhaust pipe, and the motor mount lugs at the back of the engine here. Then David Hoover made a cardboard mock-up of the plenum that covered the spark plugs. Then I covered it, the valve covers, and the other pieces with duct tape. Unfortunately, Max, my camera guy, wasn't around that weekend, so we don't have any pictures. First thing I did is I made these pads over the valve covers and this over the area that I covered uh, with cardboard. And while it was still on the motor, I glued these boards to it, as well as this board on the back here so I could keep it straight. And these boards here, which you'll see have a, a very interesting little mark here, which, if you'll come down here with me, uh -huh. lines up with this little mark right there. While the molds were still on the engine, I built up a wooden frame that held all the separate molds together. And I indexed the whole works to the back of the propeller hub in front and to the back of the crankshaft at the rear of the engine. The frame is made of scrap wood and is held together with Bondo. Bondo is a very versatile material. I'm actually laying up the parts that will eventually become the dummy valve covers in the already completed Bondo molds but the molds themselves were made the same way. I spoon on some Bondo and before it cures I throw on a piece of glass and smooth it out and I work on it until I can see that the Bondo has wet the glass. 
Then I let it harden for a while. Each layer is between a sixteenth and an eighth of an inch thick. When it cools in a few minutes, I repeat the process with another layer of Bondo and glass. After three courses, it's done. Building it up one thin layer at a time like this minimizes shrinkage and warping, and the glass in between each layer adds strength and prevents cracking. I then bonded a board to the back of each of these parts so that I could later bondo some supports to them to complete the dummy engine. With all the parts clamped back into proper position on the frame, the whole thing was carefully jigged into place on the spine. When all the leveling and measuring was done, the frame was bondoed temporarily into position. Masonite pieces were then fit and bondoed into place to support the cylinder head parts, and the exhaust and casting parts were similarly supported. When everything was cured, the molds and their framework were removed, and voila, we have a spine with a dummy engine. Now it was time to cut and glue some foam. Mike started by lofting the fuselage sections to full size. He did this by simply shooting the drawings on 35 millimeter slide film and blowing up the slides. They were then traced onto painted masonite, the kind they sell for bathrooms. Templates were made for the top and the bottom, and for the sides in the top view. That's one pound density beadboard. It can be obtained in very large blocks. Mike thinks it carves nicely, and it is considerably less messy than two pound density urethane. Those templates were used to rough cut foam blocks. When rough cutting like this, they use a wire that is simply stretched between two handles. It doesn't have a bow pulling it tight, so Mike and Max have to pull against each other to keep the wire tight. It's not very accurate, but it's quick and it's fine for roughing it out. At this time, we hot wire in the center line deep enough so that we can carve as far in as we need to and we'll always be able to find the center line. The foam is glued to the spine with micro blooms and epoxy. It doesn't shrink so it stays right where you put it. This part of the project is great fun because you can actually see an airplane taking shape. There's no way to simply and accurately cut and glue foam blocks to fit close enough around the dummy engine. So we'll use pour foam here. I've cut a piece of cardboard roughly the shape of the bottom of the cowl and I'm duct taping all the seams inside and out. This foam is powerful and it can pull a sloppily made seam apart and spill out all over the floor. I generally don't like sanding and shaping poor foam because its density varies so much that it comes out hard in some areas and soft in others and it's very difficult to carve. It makes it difficult to get a smooth surface but sometimes it's still the best way to do it, and this seems to be one of them. So we pour. This is standard tap plastic pour foam. We call it go like hell foam around here.
The bottom of the airplane is almost flat here, so I have to take it down very slowly and make sure that I keep the bottom level. The top is round, so I can get away with eyeballing it as I take it down to the proper profile. Before I can start using the section templates, I have to do enough rough cutting to get them on. This is a regular cross cut saw. When I've taken off some of the largest and most obvious parts, I switch to a serrated knife. Here we can begin a process of carving it down by eye until we can start fitting the templates onto the plug. It was different with the cowl though, I didn't have to use templates on it. I just whittled away till I found the engine. It was pretty easy, but on the rest of the fuselage I was careful to work down to the templates very slowly. I could carve all the way down only where the templates go and then bring the rest of the surfaces down to match their level, but I make fewer mistakes if I take the whole thing down together. I'm trying to slowly work the template in so that the center lines marked at the top and the bottom of the template reach to the center lines at the top and the bottom of the plug. I may see a shape emerging that I don't like and I may want to stop and change the template before I've carved it all the way down. As I move up and down here I'm comparing the curve I see at one height with the curves I see on either side of it. When I locate a bump that's not supposed to be there I slice it off and repeat the process at a different height. What, I, what I'm trying to avoid is carving too far. It's difficult to fill it back out if you've made a mistake. When I think I'm pretty close, I switch to sandpaper. This is a standard flexible bodyboard with 36 grit sandpaper. I'm always trying to sand at a 45 degree angle to the center line with the board parallel with the center line. Roughly 45 degrees and roughly parallel with the center line. It's hard to do. I sand for a while where I think it's high and then I check it with the template to see where the new high spot is. and I check it to see how close to the center lines I'm getting then I sand some more After I've gone in one direction for a while, I'll switch and sand at 45 degrees in the other direction.
You can see the bumps better sometimes under different light. I'll spend many hours looking and fussing with the various sanding tools until no matter from what angle I look, all the curves are smooth and bump free. This is 36 grit paper on a paint stir stick, one of my favorite tools. Lots of looking and fussing. Sometimes drawing lines with a straight edge will show up some bump in long curves that I might otherwise miss. As I work out the shape between templates, I often change the shape at the templates, so those changes need to be transferred back to the template using Bondo. That's duct tape over the foam. If I catch it at just the right time, I can knife off the excess easily. When I finally think it looks okay, it's time to go over to the other side and try to repeat it.
I'm pressing it in hard enough here to leave a dent. Then I'll sand until that dent goes away. It's typical of me that I'll make some subtle changes on the second side of whatever I'm working on and wind up liking it better than I like the first side. So then I have to go back and redo the first side. It happened on this project too. So I had to make those changes in the templates and go back and recarve the first side. I wish I could just get it right the first time, but doing it over usually makes it better, no matter what it is. The result of doing it over this time was that we were able to lower the bottom edges of the canopy and improve visibility for the pilot. So it was worth it. The dummy cylinder heads and spark plugs have been poked for depth so many times there's very little foam left on them, but it doesn't matter. We know exactly how far under the cowl the cylinder and exhaust pipes are going to be now. And anyway, all those gaps and dents and divots in the foam will be filled with micro balloons and epoxy just before we do the layup. I left 3 eighths of an inch of foam over the valve covers and spark plugs. Just enough space to let the engine vibrate a little without wearing a hole in the cowl. In general, what I'm trying to do here is leave just enough room for the pilot's head. It's about ready for glass. This is a big layup, so it requires help. Only epoxy can be used on styrofoam. So the holes are filled with epoxy and micro balloons. And then the entire surface is squeegeed with a thinner epoxy and micro mixture to seal its surface and prevent the foam from drawing epoxy out of the fiberglass layup they're going to apply next. The micro also helps the glass to stick to the foam so they don't have to worry about it falling off on the floor before they can get it wet out. That's one ply of uni fiberglass at around 35 degrees to the center line. The next ply will go 35 degrees to the opposite direction. Just two plies will be strong enough because we have that strong backbone inside. Now I can finally see some reflections. It looks good. Now it's time to put some Bondo on it and do the final contouring. No matter how smooth I think it is in foam, 
It will have low spots and they'll need to be filled. Rather than find each low spot and fill it individually, it usually saves time if I cover the whole surface with a sixteenth of an inch to an eighth of an inch of Bondo and let the sanding spline find the low spots. Here's how I do it. Bondo has what's known as a B stage during its curing cycle where it's not hard yet but it's just stiff enough to go after with a cheese cutter to take the high spots off easily. It takes just about that long to harden enough to start sanding without loading up the sandpaper too much. A wire brush will usually clean it up pretty well. It's good to work fast because the Bondo is getting harder all the time. As soon as I see fiberglass, I stop sanding and start filling the low spots. I try to remember not to attempt to sand out the low spots. But before I can add more Bondo, I need to scratch away the waxy surface of the cured Bondo or the new stuff won't stick. Taking advantage of Bondo's B stage again, I can take down the new stuff easily without grinding down much of the older, harder stuff. I repeat the same procedure all over the surface. I stop sanding as soon as I see the fiberglass and I fill whatever low spots remain. Once I've filled and sanded down the separate low spots, it's often necessary to cover the whole area once more and sand it all down again.
This sanding spine is made of foam rubber sheets contact cemented together. The bottom surface is 16th inch vinyl plastic. It works well in some situations to smooth out a pesky curve. If I quit early at this stage, it'll make the next stage more difficult. So I keep putting on Bondo and taking it back off again until I'm satisfied that the surface is straight and lump free. Then it's time to shoot it. I'll shoot three wet coats, come in the next day and sand them out with 80 grit paper and then shoot three more and this time sand it with 180 and finally 320 grit. This is a polyester primer surfacer called Morton's Eliminator. I use it because I'm used to it and because it allows me to build fairly thick coats and although it's a little harder to sand than more modern polyurethane primers it's a very hard and durable surface. I use the same sanding tools as before being careful to sand at plus and minus 45 degrees. There will always be some area where I sand through into the Bondo and have to reshoot. It seems to go on forever, but it's not done until it's all one color and it's all smooth. Finally, it gets marked in pencil where the canopy goes, and where the cowl starts, and where the molds are to separate, and where it needs to be recessed or joggled, and even how many plies of carbon fiber will go on the actual parts. And then I scribe those lines that need to wind up being transferred to the actual parts. When it gets waxed and PVA'd, it'll be ready to take molds off. Composites Unlimited in Scapoose, Oregon made the molds. They did a very nice job. There's the left and right sides, the rollover mold, the carburetor scoop, and the cowl molds. The male canopy mold was taken out of a female mold that was made directly on the plug. They're thick and heavily reinforced so they won't warp when they're heated to over 300 degrees in their oven. The white areas are glass layups of various thicknesses which will provide the joggles and recesses necessary to allow the parts to be taped together without leaving bumps. The fellows at Composites Unlimited also made the vacuum bagged, oven cured, carbon fiber and Nomex honeycomb cord parts from the molds. Beautiful, lightweight, strong parts. The fuselage sides are sandwiches with two or more plies of 5.7 ounce bidirectional carbon pre-impregnated cloth on the outside and one to three plies on the inside. The cowl and scoop are just four plies of carbon fiber cloth without cores. And the rollover is a heavy laminate of carbon cloth with a half inch Kevlar rope embedded in the periphery.
Phenolic hard points are incorporated into the fuselage sandwiches where the wing mount fittings and the seat belt harness will be bolted. From this point on, owner David Hoover and his crew chief Gary Dulesky took over the project in David's hangar in Hayward, California. They began assembly by making and installing the foam and fiberglass upper longerons, the glass and foam longitudinal stiffeners in the tail section, and a glass tube spreader to prevent any diaphragming in the relatively flat fuselage sides. And then they bonded in the big rollover piece. It's shaped that way so that if the airplane never got upside down on the runway, the rollover structure wouldn't hold the pilot's head straight up where it can make contact with the ground. His head can either go forward or it can go backwards into the hollowed out rollover. Then the fuselage sides were bonded and taped together. The firewall is quarter inch birch plywood, glassed on both sides and reinforced on the inside with extra glass, and foam and glass gussets where the motor mount is bolted. A fiberglass strap goes from the upper motor mounts through this slot onto the top of the longerons. The fuselage is then cut out to mount the wing. The cutout area is fitted with glass and foam sandwiches that form the pilot's thigh and calf support and tie into the wing lift fitting bulkhead. The main spar lift fittings are bolted to phenolic hard points embedded in the bulkhead as well as in the fuselage sides. Similar hard points in the fuselage sides carry loads from the trailing edge of the wing. The vertical stabilizer and rudder are hot wired out of two pound density styrofoam. Spar webs with unidirectional caps are glassed in. The tail wheel is hard mounted in this glass pocket. A glass rear spar is bonded to the foam and the whole works is covered with two plies of uni glass. The horizontal stabilizer has a foam core, a quarter inch solid maple front spar, and a glass rear spar. It's covered with carbon fiber cloth. The vertical and horizontal stabilizers are mounted to the fuselage with foam and glass. The rudder is fitted with a mass balance that swings back and forth inside this fairing. The fairings on the rudder also double as the attach points for the rudder cables. Our old friend Craig Cato built the wing and horizontal stabilizer for this project. He did a great job. The extra long flexible wing is designed to resist what's called washing in as it's loaded. Pylon racers spend much of their time in steep turns pulling very high G loads, often in rough air. If the tips increase their angle of attack when the wing is loaded, they will take a bigger bite, lifting more, thereby amplifying bumps and increasing the load on the wing. This creates a very rough ride in turbulence at the very least and in the worst case can dangerously overload the wing. Mike attempted to prevent the wing tips from twisting by making the D-tube leading edge of the spar out of stiff carbon fiber and using the less stiff fiberglass for the aft part of the wing thereby keeping the part of the wing that resists bending, the stiffest part, as far forward as possible, which should move the twist axis forward to the center of lift and eliminate this aeroelastic divergence problem. 
If it works, the pilot should report that the airplane does not ride particularly rough in turbulent air. And that's exactly what David Hoover reports. He feels no discernible amplification of bumps in rough air. The AR-5 videos don't just explain the unusual performance of the airplane, but how it's made without molds, using simple tools and techniques that can be applied to race cars, boats, motorcycles, or airplanes, or anything else that needs to be light and strong and smooth. We hope you enjoy. Making fiberglass molds chronicles the development of a six-part molded fiberglass cargo pod. It shows all the design and fabrication techniques used to produce low-cost, professional-quality production molds. Every step is explained, from first sketches, through master patterns, to male and female molds with offsets and joggles, to finished parts. <laughs> 